morning, everybody. This is Attorney Dylan Greenwood of Greenwood Law. And with us, we got Attorney Jessica Armantrout, also of Greenwood Law. And we're going to talk to you guys this morning about child support in North Carolina. And je that's something that Jessica in our office uh, handles quite a bit. Uh, it usually goes toe to toe with some sort of child custody issue. Um, and so inevitably there becomes this question of support because North Carolina has recognized, uh, as most states have, uh, that there's some duty to support uh, your children uh, financially uh, with everything that um, they're going to be going through in life. And that typically lasts until that child turns 18. Uh, More or less. Right. But there are some ways in which that might not happen. Yes. There are it's not necessarily a hard and fast 18. I sort of think that's probably the way it's referred to by people when they're just talking about it for expediency's sake maybe, but actually the law says until the child is 20 or has ceased progress in high school, well, secondary school, but high school. So if your child drops out at 16, then your obligation is obviously not gonna be the same as if maybe your child repeated first grade, so they graduate high school at 19 and the obligation continues until they're 19. Um, it can actually go to 21 for children that are in special needs classes, such as the autism classes and things like that. Okay. And what about if a child is emancipated? If a child is emancipated, then the obligation would terminate just like they had aged out and become an adult. Okay. And so when someone has a child support obligation, what is what kind of needs are trying to be met with, with those uh, okay. finances? Well, it's trying to meet the child's needs for education, food, clothing, um, extracurricular activities, things like that. Um, North Carolina uses what's called the income shares model to determine parents' income and then what the child support is based on their income. Um, and there are three worksheets that ac accomplish this. One is worksheet A, which is when one parent has primary custody of a child. And primary custody basically means they have about two thirds of the overnights a year. That would give mm -hmm. you primary custody. I think it's 243 or, yeah, 243. Mm -hmm. So um, worksheet B is if there's a joint custody arrangement, but that doesn't necessarily mean 50-50. That could just mean one, everybody has a little more than a third <laughs> of so, the overnight here. Something less here. than it could the 240. 60-40, something yeah. like that. Um, and then uh, the last one is worksheet C, which is very rarely used, is when parents have, one parent has primary custody of one child and the other parent has primary custody of another child. So um, when, uh, a court is looking at these worksheets, do they first have to make a determination on which worksheet they should use. Yes. Because that can drastically change how, how the child support is actually calculated for a given party. Yes, and that's usually apparent in the custody order. If there's no custody order, then that could be a hearing at trial based on, or trial for the child support based on what the parents have been doing and what the plan is going forward with the child. That's a pretty rare Normally, normally you have a custody order that mm -hmm. you're basing it off of, or one parent clearly has primary custody of the child. Right. So, and and so when you're entering in, so these are worksheets. So you're entering in numbers on the worksheets. You're looking at the incomes of both of the parents. Mm -hmm. Now, is that gross income or net income? It is before taxes, so it's your gross. Okay. Um, it uh, people get a little upset sometimes about the way the award shakes out, but there's credit distributed in various ways. It's not necessarily, just because you make about the same money doesn't necessarily mean there's gonna be no child support. Even at 50-50, there's all kinds of factors. Um, the parents could have children from another relationship. That's mm -hmm. factored in. They have responsibility for those children. Uh, health insurance costs, work-related childcare expenses, and there's kind of a category for something called extraordinary expenses, which is those would be pretty exceptional circumstances if your child has a need, maybe some special education need that's not covered by insurance and those costs need to be factored into the child support. There's no space for that. It's pretty uncommon, okay. um, but it is available. So, so when these, you know, if somebody's going to a hearing on these, what would you say are the most commonly litigated parts of these worksheets? Um, well, it's a lot of times it's gonna be some health insurance Mm -hmm. That can sometimes one parent says, "Well, I want to keep them on my insurance because they they don't want to have to pay the other one less, or they want to get more cash, or for whatever reason." But the biggest one is probably income. And what is income? Especially people that are self-employed or work for cash. 
that sort of that can go to a hearing if you guys can't reach some kind of compromise or agreement upon what their income is and there's risk for both you may be able to prove part of their income but not all of it you may be able to prove a little more than what they're willing to admit to or you may only be able to prove a little less it's so there, there's that's where compromise will typically come in I gotcha so once all these uh, numbers are entered into a worksheet then basically uh, you calculate it and it spews out a number as to what everybody's obligation is. Yes, it'll just spit you out a number and just because you have the kids 50-50 doesn't mean you pay your own expenses like we were talking about. It's probably the most common misconception um, that I get is, well, we have the kids 50-50, why do I have to pay child support? Well, because you make twice as much money mm -hmm. <laughs> as your ex does and that's why. Um, and few people are very happy with the outcome of that sometimes, but. Well, that's just court, Jessica. Well, yeah, <laughs> but it's a, that's a hard one to explain. This is, you know, I hear a lot of, well, why can't we just pay for the expenses on our own time? So you can, but mm -hmm. um, there's, that's also, the idea is to keep the child in the same lifestyle that they would have had the parents stayed together. And that means eliminating some of the disparity of if you have that parent that makes twice as much money then you don't want the kid to have some way better life at that parent's house and then be barely getting by at the other parent's right. house because that's not good for the kid either yeah that could kind of mess with some of the, the psychology of being with that parent yes. at a given time and mm -hmm. you know children uh, can be mm -hmm. a little bit susceptible to uh, some things and maybe not necessarily parse out mm -hmm. uh, the different living arrangements and might just look at the veneer on the outside and right. then all of a sudden uh, they may want to go to one parent over the other because of what's provided there. Right, and you don't want a child to be at a home part of the time where, like I said, there's not necessarily anything wrong with the parent, but maybe they don't have good clothes over there that fit, maybe the food is a little sparse, that, that's sort of what the child support mm -hmm. would help theoretically cover that gap. Okay. So when, are the guidelines used in all cases? Uh, not quite. Um, if the parents have a combined income of more than $360,000 a year, it used to be three hundred, but just in 2019 they bumped it up to three sixty. dollars It's about $30,000 a month, again gross not net. Um, then you would actually have a hearing where you would put on evidence for all of your child's reasonable needs and expenses. Um, you would have to put on evidence for how much food your child needs, what portion of your shelter costs, your rent or your mortgage should be attributed to children, maintenance on the home, the horseback riding lessons, all of those things um, would be factored in. Okay. So. Because horseback lessons in a situation where both tend to fall into the three hundred and sixty thousand right, dollar a right. year more income. So some of those things that are in the normal calculus of yes. of, of uh, child support. So um, when you're looking at income, what is income and what isn't income? Okay, so income. Basically, obviously, it's what's on your W-2, but there's going to be other things that could be, even if they aren't necessarily income, you can show as far as I received cash for performing this service. It will be maybe you moved back in with your parents after your separation. Um, and so if they wanted to, they could attempt to impute the income of you living at your parents' house rent free mm -hmm. and the income of you getting to eat at your parents' house and they probably aren't charging you for food for yourself and your child. Mm -hmm. And even if that reprieve is normally temporary, Sometimes it does get considered as income because that's money that you're not paying in rent, it's money that you're not paying in utilities. It's money, more money theoretically available to support the child. So you, you mentioned that the court in a situation might be able to, to impute that income. Yes, they could. What exactly does that mean? It means they would, um, let's, let's say your gross income was $2,500 a month. Um, then the court could de decide that that rent that you're not paying is worth $500 a month. So then they, put your gross income on the worksheet as $3,000 a month rather than the 2500 that you're actually bringing in. And it would just completely adjust that whole calculation. It would, it would. And depending on what the um, other person's income is and how many children are involved, it may not even really change it that much. Right, because I mean, it, it just because, you know, let's say in that situation, it was imputed income of 500 bucks that was added. Now granted, that's a um, significant increase. That's a 20% increase in mm -hmm. how that person's gross income is looked at. However, that doesn't necessarily equate one for one that it's gonna be a 20% increase in obligation for child support. Oh, ab absolutely not. Because again, it's gonna factor in all those things such as other children, um, possible other expenses, who's got the health insurance, uh, 
those things all change it and none of them are quite dollar for dollar changes mm -hmm. every single time. No, that, that makes absolute sense. So what, you know, once a child support order has been entered and everybody's kind of, they're going along, hopefully they're paying it, um, how can it be modified if it needs to be? Sure. So child support orders are eligible for a review every three years, regardless of if anything has changed, they're eligible to be looked at again. Um, if you want to do it more quickly than three years, then you would need to have a substantial change in circumstances regarding the uh, necess necessities of the child. And that's generally a 16% change in the obligation, not a 16% change in your income, but in the obligation for what your support award would be. Um, and that doesn't necessarily change 16% every time, just because someone got a raise or someone had a couple weeks of unemployment. If you, even if you recalculate it, if it doesn't become a 16% change in what the child support would be, then if it hasn't been three years, the court's not gonna likely be willing to review and recalculate. So like for instance, you know, we've had a, a lot of people oh. this year that have gone out on unemployment due mm -hmm. to COVID. Um, so you're saying that just because, you know, necessarily they've gone out on, on unemployment, you know, we did have some people that were making more mm -hmm. uh, in unemployment and with subsidies that uh, Congress had passed. Um, it wouldn't have necessarily equated to a change in circumstance, substantial change in circumstance, just because that happened. No. And I have not seen one litigated over the increase yet, um, as far as if they had an increase for a few months um, because unemployment was more than what they had been making. But as far as people that ended up making less on unemployment than they had before, what I'm seeing more of generally is judges being willing to entertain maybe a temporary modification for those few months um, or give the parents some reprieve on paying what their obligation. Maybe they don't necessarily change the obligation, but they're willing to say, okay, no one's gonna hold you in contempt because it wasn't your fault that mm -hmm. you were briefly unemployed um, or underemployed or whatever your case was. So rather than, I'm seeing a little more flexibility on people's not necessarily changing their obligation, but perhaps giving them more time to comply with it and get caught up. So besides changes in income, what other things have you seen that would be considered substantial changes of circumstance? Well, the generally an event itself is probably not a substantial change. Can be, but doesn't necessarily. Because it's fleeting. Right, doesn't necessarily have to be. I think the big one is um, maybe you have a child graduate high school and then you still got one. Maybe you have a 16 year old and 18 year old. The 18 year old graduates high school that year. So now theoretically you'd just be paying child support for one child. And people want to do a modification then. And that's, that's the appropriate step is to modify child support. However, that's going to mean the obligation has to change by 16% or more. And if, again, it were only the two children, it probably would. But there are things that would be calculated as things could have happened in the last three years. Let's say your ex got remarried um, and has two kids now mm -hmm. with the new spouse. Maybe they had twins, so they're both happened in the last three years. Um, well, now if you redo the obligation because they're getting credit for two more children and you're taking one off, then maybe it doesn't change 15% or 16%. Mm -hmm. Maybe it only changes 10 with and so that. that's not enough. And yeah, especially if you say you were doing 50-50 of those children before and it wasn't a huge award anyways, mm -hmm. it, it just may not be quite enough to get you there. That's, that's a tough thing because, you know, obviously in that scenario, those, those twins are gonna cost a lot of money together, uh, you would think, uh, kind of all at one time. Mm -hmm and you know to be able to come back and say that it's a substantial change and to meet that threshold it sounds like it's not always a given nor is it always easy to meet mm -hmm. and yes and sometimes just having a new child is in itself not a substantial change i've had one where my client had two children she was receiving child support from her ex he and his wife had a new baby my, my client did have primary custody of the children that's probably what ended up making the big difference here but when he had the new child, he went in to have child support modified, and when it was recalculated, yes, it had changed. His obligation had decreased, but it hadn't decreased by 16%. So he was not entitled to a change. Gotcha. So if, if there is a modification, uh, can the modifications be retroactive back to when the substantial change happened? 
you can ask for some type of credit from the judge, but it doesn't, it's not just a given necessarily. It would go back to when you filed. Let's say you filed your motion to modify in June, but you weren't heard until December, then your modification would be retroactive to, to, June, to, to June, when you filed. So if, if you think you've had a change, the, you need to go ahead and file pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You can always dismiss your motion if you discover that you know, maybe it wasn't what you thought or, or something like that. But if you have a legitimate good faith belief that, that there's been a change, it would be smart to go ahead and file because your credit's going right. to go back to that point in time. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I ask is because obviously, you know, stuff in court, it doesn't always happen as quickly as you want it to. Yeah. There are often times that, you know, cases get continued over and over again. So it's good to hear that, you know, the point you file is the point that basically you kind of hold your place in line mm -hmm. so that if there is a determination there, you can get that. So if, if, if a court does award that money to you and all of a sudden, uh, you know, either your obligation decreases or someone has to pay more or whatever else, how exactly practically does that work? So practically that works um, is, it, let's say your obligation was 500 a month and you um, filed a motion to modify and it turns out it should have only been 400 a month, or not should have been, but the change in circumstances brought it down to 400 a month. So, um, but if you're not heard till December when the new order is entered and you've still been paying that $500 a month, you would get $100 credit for each of those months that you've been paying and add whether or not that credit's you know, $100 a month on your obligation going forward or you just get a free month, mm -hmm. free month um, out of it. It's sort of, that can be something you can agree to with the other side or it could be up to the judge. Up to the judge. Um, if it turns out, let's say you asked for a modification because you think you should be getting paid more, um, it turns out maybe it should have been 700 a month and it was 500, then you might get that back pay for some of those months while your motion was pending. If you're just joining us here on WTOB, I'm Dylan Greenwood here with Jessica Armantrout here for the record with Greenwood Law. Uh, we're talking this weekend about child support here in North Carolina, about how to determine a child support obligation, how to modify it, uh, what all happens with child support uh, because you know it's necessary um, to fulfill those obligations for our young people that are out there, um, but you know not everybody does that. Uh, not everybody follows through on their child support obligation the way that they should as they're ordered by a court. So Jessica, if someone doesn't mm -hmm. follow through on what they should on child support, what happens? Straight to jail. Okay. Don't pass go. Don't yeah, collect two hundred dollars. That was a Parks and Recreation joke, but uh, <laughs> they uh, you can be held in contempt of court uh, if you don't pay your child support, and contempt of court does actually come with jail time sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can suspend your sentence, you know, based on if if you pay in a certain amount of time if you catch up, because there is credence, I believe, to the theory that person owes me money, they're no good to me in jail. I'm certainly not going to get it that right. way. So um, sometimes the uh, threat of jail, you know, if you're going to jail for 30 days, if you don't pay $1,000 by the end of the month, that sometimes can motivate someone to get to get going on the child support. But at the same time, can't really be held in child support if you don't have the ability to pay. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the ability to pay, so that would be some of the stuff we talked about earlier with COVID, if you don't have the ability to pay because your job was eliminated or hours reduced or something like that, that's a scenario where you're likely not going to be held in contempt of court. Now, modification of your, what you're supposed to pay is something we've talked about earlier, but the contempt part is probably something you're going to get get off with this time or at least get pretty, len pretty good leniency on because you just don't have the ability to pay. I mean, you can present evidence of, look, I have $2,000 a month coming in right now. I have $1,000 in rent. I have a $400 car payment. I have this and then I have to eat. Like I, I can't also pay right. $700 in child support. Again, if, if those two, that's your situation, you might need to consider a modification too, but if you haven't yet, then uh, that might be some argument to make on the don't hold me in contempt right now, but it won't change what you owe ultimately until you file that modification. If your arrears are accruing, um, they're accruing. Mm -hmm. and they don't ever go away. Once your child turns eight, they're not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Once the child turns 18 and graduates high school, you're not scot-free. If you still owe $10,000 from where you didn't pay for a few years or didn't pay as much as you should, that will follow you pretty much the rest of your life. That They will still take your tax return. 
you'll still have to go to court every now and then if you're not making regular payments on it. Child support is not is not something that can that can go away. It attaches for a while. Right, because uh, you know we as a society and our lawmakers have deemed it necessary to follow through on those obligations. So, yeah, they've made it pretty strict. And if you don't follow through, then it's a it's a world of hurt that can come down on you. And like Jessica said, you can't ever really run away from it. You know, in, in your practice, I see a, a lot of people come through here um, that even though their relationship may not have always ended the most amicably, mm-hmm. to say the least, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times people are at least willing to talk. Mm-hmm. And when they're willing to talk um, in, in their period of separation, because in the state of North Carolina, you have to be separated for a year before you can actually be formally divorced typically. And so a lot of times during that time period, people will come together and draw up papers that they call separation agreements, Mm -hmm. where they'll specify how the property is divided, who gets the children and when. And a lot of times in those separation agreements, there's a section that talks about child support, Mm -hmm. isn't there? Yes. um, Child support and custody are not always a good idea to put in your separation agreement most times again not every time but most times it's probably better to have that in order for some of the reasons that you know i'm sure we're going to get into particularly in the custody it's almost unenforceable to make it part of the contract but the uh, child support when that gets into a separation agreement that can get a little bit messy um, because if you agree to zero child support well it's against public policy in North Carolina just agree to zero there's mm-hmm. an argument to be made there um, so you and there's the there's dangerous thing there is if you've put something in a contract right. that's against public policy then it could invalidate the whole contract depending upon well, it certainly would invalidate that provision of the contract right. depending on how the rest of it's drafted you might be okay but um, certainly would invalidate that child support provision so you can't can't typically get out of child support, at least not on a permanent basis, um, by doing it that way or really any other way. Because we've sometimes people will put in their order, if they reach an agreement, they do what's called a consent order for child support, that there will be no cash paid between the parties. And that's fine, you can, you can do that, but you would need to say, it's not calculated pursuant to the guidelines, it's in the best interest of the child. Um, parties are just not gonna pay each other cash support, and that's fine. But remember, there's a three-year life expectancy mm-hmm. on that. Um, and a lot could happen in three years where somebody's job changes and where you agreed to that when you were making $80,000 a year, you didn't want child support. But now that you're not making mm-hmm. that much, you probably need it. So there's a lot of things that could go into that. So, But there's not a, a lifetime way to just get to get zero on it. Right, because you know, in those separation agreements or some sort of consent contract and uh, in this regard, if you start talking about child support, it, you're not held to the same standard of a three-year modification wait mm-hmm. period. It can be looked at at any time by a court. Just because it's contracted for doesn't mean somebody can't haul off the very next day and go file a child support action. It could, it could but you were, your barrier there would be you'd have to show that what was agreed to in the separation agreement wasn't reasonable, no longer meets the needs of the child. It's not called a substantial change in circumstance, but it's you have to show that it's inadequate to meet the child's needs and therefore needs to be modified in a child support order, and it can be. Um, now again, it requires a lot more specific presentation of evidence. You're starting to get into something that would be like a hearing that someone makes mm-hmm. over $360,000 a year might have, maybe not quite that, that involved, but you're getting to some of the same things. So, but that, the separation agreement, I get asked this a lot, is how can I get my ex to help contribute to college expenses for the children? Mm -hmm. Well, the the judge is not going to order that (laughs) because the children will be out of high school by then, but you can agree to it in your separation agreement. I mean, it's not gonna be child support necessarily, it's just gonna be, we agree to share this expense at some point, but that is how you can get someone committed to helping you with that expense. But then when you do agree to no child support, I've agreed to no child support in a case before where um, my client made more money. So theoretically, you think right off the bat, she would have some obligation, but she had a child from a previous marriage. Mm -hmm. She had the child on her health insurance. And so I think, and her her income was not that much more than his. Um, 
So I think when we did the child support worksheet, it came out to 33 or $34 a month. And I can't even remember who had to pay who. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so in that scenario, we agreed to zero because, I mean, what is that? Just didn't that's, make sense to even Yeah, go that's not the that. point of the statute as far as agreeing to no child support, right. you know? Um, so, but that's pretty rare exception, I think. But the, the, the college tuition is a question I get a lot. A separation agreement would be how you deal with that. Yeah, understandably so. Same probably goes for things like automobiles and these other big type of expenses mm -hmm. that are out there. Yes, it's another you know, one. How, you know, how do you share that as it goes forward? And, and that makes a lot of sense because, you know, child support from a court's perspective really is for the support of the, the needs of the child uh, as it relates to their living situation, mm -hmm. not these other necessarily big expenses. Right, right. They're not going to probably want to get into who's going to pay the child's car insurance and all that kind of stuff. Right. Now, the court would order, you know, if you ever look at the child support worksheet, and you can Google it. North Carolina Child Support Worksheet A or B. B in particular is the joint custody one, but it will crank you out a percentage on the, mm -hmm. when you calculate it, of each parent's income available to support the child. And that percentage is typically what's used to do things like um, uninsured medical expenses mm -hmm. and uh, extracurricular activities that you both agree upon. Thank you for joining us this morning on WTOB uh, while we talked about child support here in North Carolina. Uh, it's a big issue all the time, but it does pop up a little bit here in the holiday season, especially since the holiday season is in full swing. Uh, it typically means good time uh, with family, good food, and presents. Uh, have you ever felt uh, stressed to find that perfect gift for somebody? Well, a lot of people do, and for some that stress can lead to an extra holiday surprise, and that's in the form of a criminal charge. Uh, we see a significant uptick in theft-related crimes over the holidays. So join us next week as we analyze uh, North Carolina's theft laws, uh, how it relates uh, here at this time of the year. But before we go, do not forget the Greenwood Law Bill of Rights. And that's first and foremost, I will not represent myself in court. Second, I will not do law enforcement's job for them. Three, I will not make statements when stopped by law enforcement. Four, I will not consent to searches by law enforcement. And five, I will not be my own star witness for the prosecution. Remember everyone, it's not a crime to know your rights. Uh, stay safe out there, stay informed. This is For the Record with Greenwood Law, signing off.